Good morning. Good morning. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Okay, now one thing I'm going to say right off the bat. If you remember on Good Friday, okay, not just the service, but the night that Jesus was betrayed. He had gone into the, the garden. We talked a little bit about this Friday night. He took his disciples with him, and then he took some closest ones with him a little bit deeper in the garden, and he told them to do what? Pray. pray. He went a little bit further by himself to pray to God the Father. What did the, what, what did the disciples do? They all fell asleep. And we can kind of understand because they just got done with a meal. Okay? Now, you, most of you just got done with a big meal yourself. That's no excuse to do what they did. Okay? I'm going to try to speak loud and try to keep us, you know, going here. Uh, it's not about entertainment, but of course we do want to stay awake for God's word. If you would, please turn with me in your Bibles. We're going to be reading from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. And then from 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 20, I think it's going to be up on, there it is right as right already. Okay, is this scripture up there? Did we get up there, Don? Or? Okay, that's fine. So just look in your Bibles. Don't be looking up there. All right. The title of the message today is The Importance of the Resurrection. So I'm going to start with Luke 24, verses 1 through 8. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why? Do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. And then turning to 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 12. And Paul is speaking here to the Corinthian church. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. Then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all, all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do come to you today in praise and giving you glory and thanks for the many ways you touch our life, but especially going to the cross dying for us because of our sin, taking that punishment. And we come here today praising you that you have, you have been raised from the dead. You live. And because you live, we can live. Lord, we just pray now that as we hear your word, your message for us today, you would open our eyes, open our ears. But most of all, open our hearts to what you have to say. We pray this in your loving name. The name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. It may be possible, probably likely, that many of us here, some of us anyway, have had many discussions with people about your faith, about who Christ is. Maybe it's started off with a question like, do you believe in God? 
and may surprise us that a lot of people don't believe in God. They don't believe, you know, in a God whatsoever. I've had many conversations with people that, you know, they say they don't believe that there is a God at all. And then I've had those conversations with people where they believe that there's a God that's like a force, or it's just something that controls everything. Not the God of the Bible like you believe, Pastor Brian, but, or others believe, but there's just something out there guiding things along. And then there's some that believe that, yeah, they believe the biblical God. And they even believe that Jesus existed, but they don't necessarily believe that Jesus rose from the dead. There's a lot of pastors, and I don't mean just in different religions or different denominations. It may surprise you the teaching that's going on today that a lot of pastors are saying that they believe in Christ. They believe his stories. They believe the miracles he did. They believe he died on the cross, but they won't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe it's possible. I've had discussions with people like that, and it may surprise us. But actually, Paul faced this same dilemma in the Corinthian church. Not so much that Christ hasn't been, hadn't been raised from the dead, but they believed that for the Christian, even for the believers, that there was no resurrection for them. They believed that their, the teaching was simply this, they believed in Christ, they believed he died, they believed he had been raised, but for the people, normal people, that once you died, you just kind of simply died. You didn't have the resurrection. You lived for Christ in this life. And this was just one of the problems, one of the false teachings that was taking place in the Corinthian church at that time. Now, in the New Testament, we see two main religious groups. You have the Pharisees, and then you have the Sadducees. The Pharisees were the religious leaders who were basically the common folk, all right, like us. They were the Pharisees. They also may have had other jobs to go along with it. The Sadducees were the elite. They were the rich people. They were the aristocrats. They had ties in with Rome, okay? So they had political ties tie in with, with Rome and that. The Pharisees believed in the whole Old Testament. From Genesis all the way through it, they believed that every single word was from God. The Sadducees believed just the first five books that Moses wrote. That those were the only true words from God. Okay? The rest of it was good, but it wasn't directly from God. One of the biggest differences, though, was... I'm going to move this before I kick it over. Was that the Pharisees believed that in a resurrection. Even though they didn't necessarily believe in Christ, they believed that there was going to be a resurrection for those who were devout to God. The Sadducees did not. They believed that once you died, that was it. Even though you had faith in God, you simply lived for him in this life and that when you died there was nothing else that's why they were sad you see <laughs> if you didn't get that you will later now we don't know if it's, that's how the teaching got to the Corinthian church but we do know that the teaching was pretty similar that was taking place now, oftentimes when we have a disagreement with somebody, we go on our defense of, of trying to explain something with facts that we know. For instance, if I was to say that two plus two equals five, you should see the looks I just got. This young, uh, what's your name again? She just went. Okay, yes, I know that is actually four. The word that we've given for that number is four. But if I wanted to say five, you're gonna say, no, we've been told that word is four, even though I'm only holding four fingers up, if I want to say it's five, or if I went like this, you're going to vend it by giving me facts, right? For this argument, or for this discussion, Paul decided to take a different route. He said, okay, let's suppose for a moment 
that it's true. Let's suppose for a moment that we do not have a resurrection as believers in Christ. What's the consequences? What happens if we don't? He kind of just decided to go a different route. What happens if there is no resurrection of the dead? So Paul, and the first thing that we see is this. Our personal faith and witnessing is meaningless if Christ is not risen. Our personal faith and witnessing is meaningless if Christ is not risen. Think a moment of all the great pastors, besides me, but all the great pastors through time. Spurgeon in London, Dwight L. Moody in Chicago. They could use a Dwight L. Moody right now. David Livingston in Africa. David Jeremiah in California. Billy Graham, and now Franklin Graham, traveled, you know, following in his father's footsteps. Think of all the times, all the words that are wasted if there is no resurrection. If there's nothing after this life. Because that's the basis why Christ died to give us life. That's the basis of their preaching. To give life. Now, I understand we do not take the words of just one person just because one person said it, no matter how great they are. That's how cults are formed. But we are to take what they tell us and study them. Okay? Not just take it for granted that that's the truth. And you will hear me say this over and over in time again. It is your job, your responsibility to what I say up here to go check and make sure it's true. To make sure that I'm not leading you astray or I haven't made a mistake. That happens from time to time. It's your job when Scott is teaching Sunday school to go make sure that what he's teaching us is true. Okay? Okay, so we understand that. <clears throat> Excuse me. You've heard me also say it already, that you cannot have Easter Sunday without Good Friday. You can't have the reason to celebrate today if we don't have, to, if we don't have Good Friday. That's why it's so important that we do remember somehow what took place on Friday. I also say this, we cannot have salvation without the Resurrection Sunday. We cannot be saved if the resurrection never took place. And that's what Paul was saying here. That if there is no resurrection, then Christ has never been resurrected. And if that is true, then we cannot be saved. Some people may say, well, Jesus still died on the cross. Yes, I get that. But what did Jesus say just a few short hours to his disciples that night in the upper room before he went to the cross? John 14, we read these words. You probably know it. You can follow along with me, say it with me. For God so loved the world. John 3, 16. Now go to John 14. I am the way, the truth, and... That last part, okay? That last part. If we want to get to God, it's got to come through who? Jesus. And if he has never been resurrected, still dead, how do we do that? How can we possibly come to God if Jesus is still dead when he's the only way to him? And that's what Paul was saying here. He said, if we don't have a resurrection, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then you're saying that Christ has not been resurrected. And that can't be true. See, we have to remember that we have been given evidence of truth, not just proof, evidence of truth of the resurrection of Christ. I know I'm taking a few minutes. Oh, I got still got an hour to go. 
<laughs> we have been given evidence of truth. As I said, not just proof, but truth of the resurrection of Christ. It is truth. In Matthew 27, we read of you know, the story that took place at the crucifixion. And after the crucifixion, some of those religious leaders that cried for his crucifixion then went up to Pilate and basically just kind of just going to paraphrase, basically did this. Went to Pilate and said, hey, this guy, Jesus, claimed that he was going to rise on the third day. We heard those teachings. So they'd been there when he had taught. Okay, they heard him speaking to people. He said that he told them that he would rise from the dead. So we're afraid that one of his disciples or a couple were going to sneak over to that burial place where they got, where they put him and go in there and steal that body out of there and then say that he raised from the dead. So this is what we want you to do. Put a guard over there. Now it would have been a Roman guard, not just a temple guard, which would have been Jewish, but a Roman guard. It was, it was several of them, not just one or two. And then we want you to put a big old stone in front of it. And they kept on saying it was because they're afraid that somebody might go steal the body. The more I study that, the more I, I don't think, I think there's more to it than what they were saying. Think of it like this. As I said, they had been there with Jesus's teachings. They had also seen, someone had also seen the miracles that Jesus had done. They knew what took place when Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. They heard the story of him walking on water, raising others from the dead, just all these miracles. So what I believe, and I don't say this, come around and sell us this, that's what I'm saying over here, but I believe it's very possible that they were taken and thinking, what if this guy's able to do what he said he's able to do? What if he's actually going to rise that day? Because think about all they would have had to do is put a couple guards there. The Jewish people were not going to go mess with Roman guards. Okay, unless you're a zealot, that's a whole different deal. They weren't going to go there and pick a fight with some Roman guards in front of that tomb. I believe that, that it's very possible that that stone was rolled there, not necessarily from somebody getting in, but from Jesus getting out. I truly think that that is very, very likely. They're trying to bring, keep Jesus in there because they're afraid, what if this is what this guy has been claiming is true? Now, I know that in itself is not evidence, but let's look at something else. What about the testimony of the disciples and others who claimed that they saw Jesus after his resurrection, after his death, after his burial, and then his resurrection, those that claimed to saw him and be with him? I mean, think about it. Of the 11 disciples that were left, 10 of them at least, maybe even John, we're, we don't know for sure about John. Tradition says that he died of old age. We're not 100% about, positive about that, but we'll go with that. But at least the other 10 all died our martyr's death because of their claim of Christ being alive. Of putting your faith in a living Christ. And when I say he died, I don't mean they just, you know, or put to death. That wasn't an easy death. It was beheadings that took place. Hanging on crosses, hanging upside down on crosses, being dipped in oil. Now, if you had made up a story, you might defend it to a certain degree. But to have 10 people defending it to when they're being put in prison and being beaten, and not changing a word of their story, that tells us something. That they are not just making this story up of what they saw. Look at the, the ladies that went to the tomb and their testimony as well. We have the testimony of angels. Remember when the women went there? We just read about it. They went there to finish preparing the body for the burial. And who's there? The angels are there. These are God's creation. I don't think they're just going to make up a story, you know, and just so we have their testimony. 
You see, when we really truly look at this message of Paul and our message today, it's not to prove Christ's resurrection, but to proclaim Christ's resurrection. That's what we are supposed to be doing. The proof is already given to us. We just need to read the words and study them and come to the truth of them. You see, we have to remember also this. We cannot be saved by believing with just our head or our mind about the resurrection of Christ. We must accept the truth with our heart which means full commitment to the resurrected Christ. I know it's up there, but I'm going to say it again. We cannot be saved by simply or by believing with our head or mind. It may start there, but we have to do a little bit more about the resurrection of Christ. We must accept the truth with our heart, which means full commitment to the resurrected Christ. That means giving ourselves totally. And sometimes we like, I'll be the first to admit, I've done this before, and I'm still tempted at times to do it. We'll say, okay, God, I'll give you today just a little bit, but I'm going to hold back so I can go do this. That's a t- the temptation. We must remember we are called to give a full commitment to him of our lives. Which brings us then to this question as we wrap it up. Do you, do we have a burning heart? Do we have a burning heart? In Luke 24, we're told of two followers of Jesus that were walking down the road to a town called Emmaus. And as they're walking along, they're talking about the situation, what's taking place with the, the crucifixion and the rumors that's going around about Jesus being raised and that. And suddenly, who's walking right along with them? Jesus. Do they realize who it is at first? No. Now there's a lot of different speculations why they didn't realize. That doesn't really matter. The fact is they didn't realize who it was at first. And they're still talking. So Jesus asked them, said, hey, even though they're talking about him, he knows kind of what took place that day. He goes, what are you talking about? So they explained the story to him. Actually, first first thing they say, where have you been? Have you not heard what's, ta- what's been happening around here? So they tell him the whole story and everything. And later on, Jesus reveals himself to them. And then he disappears. He breaks bread with them and they eat together and just different things there. And they worship together. And then he reveals on who he is and then he leaves them. And then they turn to each other and they say these words. We're not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us on the road and then opened the scriptures to us. So at first they may not realize who he was, but they had this burning inside of them already started. And then when he revealed them to him or himself to them, excuse me. You see, when the resurrection is accepted by faith, a power comes into our lives that is possible no other way. We get something that we never th- maybe thought we'd ever get. And when I say power, it's more than just you know, strength, power, but the ability to do whatever he calls us to do when we put our faith in him. I'm going to share with you just a little bit here. When I was in high school, actually even when I was in junior high, I had people coming up to me and saying, Brian, you should go into the ministry you should become a pastor. My words were exactly these. Don't want nothing to do with it. Now, I was going to church. I was saved about the sixth grade, you know, but I still lived the the teenage years. So teenagers, I get it. Even though I'm old now, I still get it, okay? But when people, especially in high school, when you're supposed to be making up what you're supposed to be doing for the rest of your life, okay? I wanted nothing to do with being a pastor. I loved my pastor. I want nothing to do with doing one. Later on, I recommitted my life to Christ in 96. And I remember praying, I was at work, I remember praying to to Christ, I said, okay, if you want me to be getting the ministry somehow as a pastor, whatever it is that you're calling me to do, 
you got to open my eyes and show me pretty soon what it is. The next day, I got a call from a local church. Wanted to know if I could come fill in. I'd only filled in at my church one time and it didn't go so good. Okay? It was like a five minute sermon, which you wish you had right now. I get it. Okay? But they called me to know if I could come and just fill in. I said, I've never done this before. I said, well, we've heard about you. I don't know why you've heard about me, but anyway, whatever. A year later, I was getting a call to go to my first church as a youth pastor. When they decided for some reason to put their ad in a regular newspaper instead of the route that they were going. And a friend of mine just happened to see it. You see, when we truly come to him, he opens doors. He gives us power that we thought we would never or never even dreamed of. Christianity is founded though in the resurrection of Christ. That's how we get that power in the resurrection of Christ. Unless he arose, we have no motive for going and sharing the good news with everyone we can. What's the point if he hasn't risen from the dead? Because when you think about it, if he hasn't risen from the dead, we just have another simply dead religion instead of a relationship with a living Savior. Let's pray. Lord, again, we do praise you and thank you. We praise you and thank you for your teachings, for the way you heal people, the teachings that still touch our hearts in so many ways today. We thank you and praise you for going to that cross, dying for us, and then we praise you today as our living Lord, our resurrected Savior, who has promised that when we come to you and ask you for forgiveness of sin, we are promised exactly that. That you completely forgive every sin, past, present, and future. That you are our eternal Savior. That even when we still mess up, you are still our Lord. Lord, we do pray today that if there is someone here that's never come to you as their resurrected Lord and asked you for forgiveness of sin, that they would not pass on that opportunity today to do so. Lord, we thank you for the promises we have, not just of forgiveness of sin, but for what it brings a resurrected, a new life to come, an eternal life to come of being in glory with you and through you to God the Father. Lord, touch our hearts. Open what you want, our eyes, our minds to you, our resurrected Savior. Amen.